KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we've had some breaking news since we last saw you at 5 o'clock. San Antonio police on the scene of two separate shootings. The first one here in the 8500 block of Broadway that is near Loop 410 on the north side. A gas station convenience store dispatchers got the call a little after 5 o'clock. Police telling us a 19 year old shot several times here. He was taken to University Hospital in stable condition. No suspect or suspects in custody. Police investigating the cause of the shooting. We have a crew on the scene. We're working to get more information. Hope to have it during this newscast. And officers are also on the scene of another shooting called in just before that one on Broadway near 410. This is in the 100 block of Roundtree. That's on the northeast side between Randolph Boulevard and I-35. Police responded here about 455 p.m. They found a car crashed into a fence like you see there. Our Lee Waldman is there working to get information about what happened here. We hope to get more updates on both of these shootings sometime during this newscast. Yeah, from shootings to scratch offs, scratch offs getting ripped off. Less than two weeks ago, we told you about a man who was arrested for stealing lottery tickets at one store, then cashing them in at another. And it's the store owners that are on the hook for that money when those scratch offs get stolen. One local owner tells our Garrett Berger what could help keep that from happening. Forget register robberies. Anwar Tahir says this is a bigger problem. Because it's easy access, it's sitting there. Thieves trying to push their luck, stealing lottery tickets. Like at his store at the Lille Food Mart last week. So as soon as the, the employee went there, in the meantime, he took the lottery and he ran. Tahir, who's part of the Association of Convenience Store Retailers in San Antonio, says it's a common problem for store owners and provide a video of other thefts, like this one at the Primo Food Mart on Castroville Road. Though that owner was surprised by the crime. This is the first time in my 12 years running business, and never happened out of this one. Those tickets have value. Stores activate the scratchers by the package before they sell them. So any winners in those stolen cases could be redeemed. The lottery does deactivate tickets that are reported stolen. But if thieves can find and cash in the winners first, store owners are on the hook for that range of tickets. They are around about five to seven thousand dollars. It cost us. To hear thinks it would be better if stores could just activate the tickets individually at the time they sell them. If they are stolen, the whole dispenser is just a paper for them, so they cannot cash it. Though not everyone is as keen on that idea. If you do like this, a hassle for us. Every time we activate, every time we activate. No, this is it's impossible. Though this sure seems like a hassle too. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Now, a state lottery spokeswoman told us in an email that assigning tickets by the package versus the individual activation is an industry standard. She said there are no plans right now to try individual activation for those tickets. The explosion on Friday not caused by a drug lab or an explosive device. That's the word from the San Antonio Fire Department today during their first press conference since that explosion. Four people died. Two of them identified as 36-year-old Roger Huron Jr. and 28-year-old Ashley Ottoby. The others, men ages 57 and 61. Courtney Friedman gives us a better picture of just how powerful that blast was. There was a tree probably 100 feet in front of the house. It was like disintegrate. It was charred. Friday's explosion rocked the 75-acre property, sending debris up to 150 yards away from the structure where it happened. And we have a before and after picture. This house was underground. They confirmed today that this was, in fact, a house 12 feet underground, fully made of concrete and reinforced by rebar right here. The chief told us today that there were two victims found inside the house and two outside. While drug labs and explosives have been ruled out, investigators are looking into a possible gas leak. We did have some reports from uh, some of the people that were on property uh, several hours before the explosion um, that they smelled gas. So we are examining the propane tank that's on uh, the site uh, and that's going to be an ongoing investigation. CPS Energy has confirmed they do not service that property. The property owner who lives in that underground home is also the owner of K-Bar Construction. We found about 100 vehicles, uh, construction vehicles, tank, tank trucks, uh, road graders, uh, you name it, RVs. Combing a large scene like that has been a challenge. New Braunfels dive teams were brought in to search the nearby pond and investigators at the scene are wrapping up, but the investigation is far from over. We are still looking into some leads. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. 
Some good news in all of this. There were six dogs found on that property that were not injured. They have been returned to their owners. And the San Antonio Fire Department tells us just a few minutes ago that they are done investigating on the site of that explosion. San Antonio police searching for leads in the murder of an Army veteran two years ago. 27-year-old Bernard Terry shot the morning of December 13th, 2020. It happened in the 17,400 block of Judson Road near George Cooper Street. Back then, his family told us that he had been gunned down on his way home. When officers reached the scene, they found Terry's car stopped in the middle of the street. Bernard, Bernard had been shot in the head. Investigators say two cars were seen speeding from the scene. One is a white or silver sedan with a loud exhaust system. The other black or gray, possibly a Dodge Charger. Anyone with information that can help police solve this case has to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Some emotional testimony today in the trial of a man accused of killing a Bear County Sheriff's Office canine back in 2019. Canine Chucky's handler took the stand as the trial of Matthew Morellas continues. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom. He's a spoiled dog at home. Bear County Sheriff's Office Deputy Kevin Rasmussen taking the stand and speaking about his relationship with canine Chucky and now he was also a part of his family. He played with my oldest boy, um, just laid around the house. For two years, Deputy Rasmussen was Chucky's handler, but the partnership would end on January 25th, 2019, after Deputy Rasmussen took part in a chase involving the defendant, Matthew Mireles. Deputy Rasmussen then recalled the moments when he deployed K-9 Chucky and then seeing him get shot and go down. Do what I told him to do. Stop the threat. Um, Everybody surrounding the, the suspect and Chucky laying there. Mireles is charged with interfering with a police service animal and eight counts of aggravated assault on a public servant. Mireles had fled a traffic stop in Carnes County, leading officers on a chase through the three counties before running out of gas at Loop 1604 and Highway 151. A standoff began with Mireles waving a gun around and eventually allegedly shooting K-9 Chucky. The loss of K-9 Chucky, one that was very hard for Deputy Rasmussen. I'm trying to think how to call my, my family and let them know. If found guilty of the charges, Mireles is facing anywhere from 25 years to life in prison because the charge includes a habitual offender enhancement allegation due to Mireles previously being convicted. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic right now. We're going to go to I-10 and Probant and show you the situation right there. You can see uh, moving towards us is the, the problem. There's actually a uh, vehicle that seems to be stalled or pulled over. Again, this is I-10 and Probant really slowing things down in both directions, uh, but an area you may want to stay away from. A big boost for Texas Biomedical Research Institute here in San Antonio. A federal agency has now recognized it as the only prime contractor in Texas to be able to work with the federal level to protect against pandemics and bioterrorism. Now, being named a prime contractor opens Texas Biomed up to receiving up to $100 million in funding over the next five years. That money comes from BARDA. That's the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It's within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. BARDA oversees the development of vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics for public health emergencies like a pandemic, for example. You might remember that Texas Biomed helped in the development of the Pfizer COVID vaccine before it was rolled out. Fewer than 15 labs across the country have this federal designation that Texas Biomed now holds. I want to go back to that breaking news we had off the top of the show. Officers on the scene of a shooting called out just before the one that we talked about earlier on Broadway. It is off I-35 and uh, Randolph area in the 100 block of Roundtree. That's on the northeast side. Police responded a little before 5 o'clock there. Our Lee Waldman is there at the scene gathering some more information about what exactly happened out there, Lee. 
Myra, Steve, we're being told by San Antonio police officers that this is a fatal shooting here. It's right near uh, Roundtree and Sudeth. I'm going to step out of the way so you can get a better look at this scene that's unfolding. You can see it's still extremely active. I want you to focus on that car there that's crashed through that wind of that wall rather. Now, police tell me that they found a young Hispanic man lying in the street not far from that car. When police got on scene, they found him unresponsive with gunshot wounds. He was taken to Bamsey, where he later died. Now, police say there was a shootout between his vehicle, that one crashed there, and a white either sedan or Jeep. Now, police also say looking through this crime scene area, they found two different kinds of shell casings, one from a handgun, the other from a rifle. They said they're still working on that suspect information, but they are still looking for that white either sedan or Jeep vehicle. But they say that shooting led to that crash and that young man, he then Lie, lay in the street and that's where police found him unresponsive. They're still working on gathering information. We just got done speaking with the SAPD sergeant just a few minutes before we checked in with you all and they said their homicide detectives are on their way out here to begin their information. They're working to figure out what exactly happened here, but this is filled with houses, neighbors sitting outside trying to figure out what's going on just uh, just across the street from their homes here on, on Roundtree and Sudeth. All right, our Lee Waldman reporting on that shooting and the information we have just learned. Lee, we'll check in with you as more information develops here. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Lee. All right, let's switch to the weather situation right now. And the temperatures are dropping, if you haven't noticed. Humidity already seems to be out of the area. Oh, yeah, it is. That's the biggest change right now. The humidity has been swept away. Dew points are down in the 40s, 46 degree dew point officially at the airport in town. Just a few hours ago, we had a dew point of 60 degrees. It was muggy earlier today. Now that humidity is swept away. 68 degrees for our air temperature at the moment. You look across the state, you tell a cold front's been moving through. It has yet to make it to the Gulf Coast where temperatures are still well in the 70s, but you get farther behind it and you get to Lubbock 47, Amarillo 46, El Paso. 48 degrees officially right now at the airport we're at 68 and temperatures will gradually respond to this front. The lack of humidity that's immediate cooler temperatures is going to be gradual by 10 o'clock we will be at 61 degrees midnight will dip down into the 50s and tomorrow morning we'll start the day in the low to mid 50s about 53 around San Antonio closer to 50 as you get to Bulverde and Canyon Lake and even some upper 40s in the hill country but check out this morning temperature trend. Thursday and Friday, we're down in the upper 30s when you go to the bus stop in the morning. Jacket weather on the way. We'll talk about high temperatures and how mountain cedar is likely to change here very soon. In just a bit. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez. Coming up tonight on the Night Beat, drag queens return to the stage tonight in San Antonio. This is coming days after threats were made against similar shows nationwide. We'll discuss the efforts to protect those who are going to tonight's performance. Plus, protecting the San Antonio area from potential cyber threats. We're going to go inside the Alamo Regional Security Operations Center one year after it opened. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on the Night Beat. See you then. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, new at six, there's been a lot of confusion over the wheezing and sneezing we're all hearing. Is it mountain cedar, COVID, the flu, or just a cold? The vaccine situation also getting complicated on top of questions about whether allergy shots are something you need now too. Ursula Perry with lab trials on a new nasal spray that could lessen your COVID risk instead of a shot. From allergy relief to protection from the flu, nasal sprays deliver medication directly into your respiratory system. Now Yale researchers are testing a COVID booster nasal spray. The reason we're focusing on the nasal cavity is because that's where the virus first lands. This immunologist says that current mRNA boosters lose strength over time. They're not as effective in the nose and the respiratory tract. The Yale nasal spray contains spike proteins from the coronavirus. Essentially, it's a booster that contains the right vaccine antigen inside that bottle. For some patients who are reluctant to get the COVID booster because they hate needles, a nasal spray could be a better option. He says there are also some other benefits. It may have less 
side effect than having a shot. So people who are afraid of the side effect, uh, hopefully this will also alleviate uh, such hesitation. Yale University has licensed the nasal vaccine booster idea, which first requires the regular booster shot in the muscle that many of us already received. But then later, the nasal spray booster directly into the nose. And speaking of noses, studies are showing that saline can reduce the amount of COVID-19 in your nose. In fact, one study is showing that a simple nasal irrigation with saline can reduce the severity of your COVID-19 infection. And while you're at it, if you're suffering from mountain cedar, these systems are pretty easy to use and they're effective on allergies as well. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. And speaking of mountain cedar, we've got that to talk about in the forecast as well as this cold front. Adam. I'm not happy about mountain cedar being added to the mix right now, Adam. Yeah, it, it first reared its ugly head, uh, what, five, six days ago, and it's it's back and it's here to stay, of course. It usually peaks in mid-January and then is gone by Valentine's Day. Let's get to our mountain cedar count and then I'll get to the forecast here today. The count is at 70. Okay, that's which is low. However, remember one of the highest concentration of mountain cedar trees is up in the hill country. And guess what? We're going to have that northwesterly wind all day tomorrow and you're going to notice it, which means the cedar count is likely to rise. It doesn't guarantee it, but typically when we get a north or northwesterly wind this time of year, when the mountain cedars tossing their pollen around, it gets blown into San Antonio and locations outside of the hill country. So I am expecting the mountain cedar count to rise a bit as we get into tomorrow. But overall, it's going to be a gusty day. Northwesterly wind steady at 10 to 20 miles per hour. And I do think we'll have some gusts tomorrow up to 30, maybe even 35 miles per hour. We'll start the day at 6 a.m., maybe some gusts to 15. But 10 a.m. to noon, that's when we can see some of those wind gusts around and possibly even in excess of 30 miles per hour. And that's all out of the northwest, which typically increases the mountain cedar count this time of year. Temperature wise, big difference out there. 59 in Rock Springs. Meanwhile, 75 in Kennedy, 75 Victoria and Gonzales. So we've got that discrepancy from northwest to southeast because that cold front is moving through right now. And temperatures will be slow to really drop off with this front. The humidity, that's the immediate effect you're going to feel, the lack of mugginess. And that's the case locally. Temp right now, 70 on the west side. Converse right now at 68 degrees. Tomorrow morning, uh, we'll start the day in the 50s. By the afternoon, we're well into the 60s. So we've been right around 80 degrees for quite some time. Today our high was 79. So we're going to cut that down a little bit tomorrow, but more notably in the days ahead, especially as we get into the upcoming weekend. Tomorrow, upper 60s, 68 in San Antonio, Comfort Bernie at 64 degrees. Very similar on Thursday. By Friday, we dropped to 62. Check out Saturday. A high temperature, the warmest we'll get during the day, 50 degrees. That's probably the best we can do on Saturday. Sunday and Monday will be in the mid 50s. And overall, it looks like we're getting into a pattern here of below average temperatures for even an extended period of time. Here's the longer range outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, and this is for next week. Notice December 20th to 26th. So we're talking days leading up to Christmas through Christmas and this dark blue indicates below average to even well below average. Basically, it's the probability of being below average and it's pretty significant. It's likely that most of the lower 48 is going to be below average and with the exception of California. That's about it. So temperature is likely to be well below average as we get into the days leading up to Christmas. The exact specifics too soon to tell, but I do think we will have some sub freezing temperatures during the mornings, say next Friday and then Christmas Eve and maybe even Christmas Day. We could at least have that. We'll get into the Christmas climatology. What is average coming up next half hour? But right now trends are looking colder. All right, let's talk about our overall weather pattern and the severe weather threat now moving East Texas, especially Louisiana, Arkansas. Unfortunately, some damaging storms earlier today uh, in and around the Metroplex. But you just look at the broad scale of this system. Big old pinwheel like circulation to this classic fall early winter system snow on the cold side of it and this big upper level low pressure system that's going to linger around for several more days and probably even have some replacement of it as 
we get into next week. So this is going to linger, which will have a direct impact on our temperatures being below average and then probably a reinforcing shot of cool air coming in on the way behind it. Rain chance is pretty slim. A few sprinkles tonight and by sunrise tomorrow, then 30% Saturday and Monday. Tomorrow we'll start the day with the clouds, then sunny 53 in the morning, 67 in the afternoon. And then we talked about the weekend, not only cool on Saturday, but cloudy and a little damp at times with some very light showers here and there. Okay, next couple of weeks looking interesting. Thanks, Adam. All right, nothing against Frisco. It's a fine city. Been there many times, but Orlando is like known as a vacation hotspot. So I'm guessing the UTSA Roadrunners maybe like this destination. Well, actually, they fit right in because nobody's from Orlando, right? Because everybody works at yeah, Disney, right? right? And, okay, so in this particular case, they're just mixing in with everybody else who are the transient residents there, and they are loving it. When we come back, we're live from Orlando. And look who's headed to the national semifinals in FCS, the Incarnate Word. You got it, Cardinals. And don't forget, Birdie's also headed to state coming up. UTSA Roadrunners meet Detroit Trojans for the first time in school history. The Duluth Treating Cure Bowl this Friday afternoon in Orlando. They will be one and a half point underdogs as they hope to secure their first bowl win in school history. Both come into this matchup as conference champions with 11 and 2 records, both on 10 game win streaks. So to say this will be an even matchup would be an understatement. But more, let's take a on this matchup. Let's take it live to Orlando. That's where we find our Larry Ramirez. Hey, Larry. Hello, Greg, and good evening, everybody. We are expecting a fantastic bowl game between UTSA and Troy Friday here in Orlando. Both teams are ranked in the top 25 in all three major polls, and both teams, well, as you would expect, they want to finish the regular season the same way. Now, following practice this morning, both teams and head coaches and select members from those teams held a press conference right here. Troy went first, followed by UTSA. Both sides held photo ops with the trophy and signed items to be auctioned off with the proceeds supporting the Cure Bowl and the fight to cure cancer. The bull mascot, the Cure Bear, even made an appearance. Both head coaches have mad respect for the other's program. Our players are very excited. Uh, as soon as we heard the announcement where we were going, uh, they've been excited ever since. The destination is fantastic. And the opponent, we have a lot of respect for. And it's, it's a great opportunity um, to show a lot of people how good a football we play at UTSA against a great opponent in Troy. A lot of respect for Texas San Antonio and the season they've had. I think two of the premier group of five college football programs right now without question. You look, our seasons have been very similar, um, and I think it's a tremendous matchup with two really well-coached teams, two very talented teams, uh, and it should be a really good football game. And i um, excited to be here and excited for our players to have the opportunity to experience this week. Dadrian Taylor, Frank Harris, and Rashad Wisdom were the three players representing UTSA. We will hear from them tonight at 10. And Troy's head coach gave the Roadrunners offense a huge compliment. We got that as well. Greg, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Larry. While the UTSA Roadrunners are in Orlando, the University of the Incarnate Word Cardinals preparing for their FCS semifinals in Fargo, where they're set to face North Dakota State Bison this Friday night with a chance to go to the championship game. This is the second ever meeting between these two schools with the Bison shutting out the Cardinals in 2014, 58 to nothing. But this is a much different team since their meeting nine years ago. That's after the Cardinals beat second seed Sacramento State in Sacramento last weekend, 66 to 63, and the highest scoring game in SES playoff history. But remember, North Dakota State is coming off its 17th national championship, is fourth in defense against the pass, while UIW is number one in scoring. We got the opportunity to, to knock off the defending national champions, uh, primetime TV. Uh, great opportunity for these guys, for the university to, you know, go put our mark on this thing. So we're, we're all just excited and ready to go. All right. Kick off between UIW and North Dakota State Friday nights at 6 p.m. All right, for the first time in school history, the Burning Greyhounds will be playing for the state championship in Class 4A Division 1 when they meet China Spring in AT&T Stadium in Arlington this Friday. And they will do so with another first in school history, an undefeated 15-0 record, ranked number one in 12's top 12 sub-5A poll. That's after arguably their best game of the season when they shut out Chapel Hill in the Alamo Dome. 35 to nothing. At the same time, China Spring brings a 14-1 record into this matchup after edging out Decatur 33-27. We played very well together, and that's our, our thing. We play together, and we've been just doing this ever since the summer, and uh, we've been really, really, really working on uh, just being more physical than our opponent. When we got to this game and we won, I mean, it really hit me. I was just so proud, and I mean, I can't wait to go play in Arlington, and 
we're playing a good team, so we're going to have to bring the fight to them. All right, kickoff is at 3 o'clock in Jerry World. We'll all be there for all these games coming up. What a busy Friday. Yeah, it's going to be a very busy Friday. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Greg. Sure. We'll be right back.